Hi, my name is Kevin Haynes. I'm one of the instructors at Sunset International Bible Institute. I've been there mm, about 13 years now and have the opportunity to share with our Amers Christian Evidences as well as the two-year students. I also have the opportunity to teach Isaiah and 1 Corinthians and several other letters of Paul. But what I want to do today, what, I, what I'm really looking forward to today, is to spend some time looking at the, one of the Psalms uh, with you. Um, we've been doing this for the last few weeks and looking at some of the Psalms, and this one has become one of my favorites. It's Psalm 139. A lot of times when you get to the end of a book, it's, you know, you're kind of at the closing chapters and, and you may have already, everything's been revealed to you if you're looking at a murder mystery or whatever else. But one of the things that happens with the Psalms, particularly, we know that in the Old Testament uh, and particularly in the New Testament, this became the hymnal for so many. And Psalm 139 was that way as well. There are some who look at Psalm 139 and believe that David must have been a young man when he wrote it, but there are several things in it that would make me tend to think that he was probably an older man and looking back and, and had grown in, it, in his knowledge and had learned an awful lot from God and from just experience in life. It also has to do, at least the end of Psalm 139 seems to, he seems to be fearful of people who are coming after him. And so there are some things in it that again would just make me think that he is probably older in his life. Um, again, it's become one of my favorite Psalms. Probably early on, it was not so because it reminded me of a song when I was just a young boy uh, out of the hymnal called The All-Seeing Eye, Watching You, I think was another title that they used it. And I remember hearing that song and being kind of afraid of thinking of God being up there somewhere and always looking around to see if God was watching me and was, was paying attention to me. I was not the uh, best behaved boy. And so there were a lot of things that I didn't want God to see. I didn't want him watching. I didn't want him paying attention to the way that I was living. And so it was, it was scary to me, at least a little bit. And then when I began to read this right here, I thought to myself the same thing. This seems a little more scary, but that's not the point of this psalm. The reason for this psalm is not to scare us, it's not to frighten us, it's not to drive us away, it's to embrace this very thought that God knows us completely. And not just the fact that he knows us completely, he loves us anyway. Some of us, the more we tend to reveal about ourselves, the more we become afraid of people, if they know us that well, they're not going to love me very long. Well, that's not the case with God, and it wasn't the case as David writes it and, and talks about God as well. There are really four areas right here, and we don't have time to develop all of those, but there are really four areas that are talked about in this psalm. In the beginning, they're going to talk about God's knowledge. David talks about how intimately he knows him, everything he thinks, everything he says. The second section is the way that God is everywhere, God's presence. And it's not just that he's everywhere out there, but it's He's with me, and that's that's important as well. The third area is the fact that God formed David himself in the womb, numbered his days, knew exactly how long he was going to be on this earth. And then the fourth area is a prayer from David that says, "I want to be like you, God. I want to love what you love. I want to hate what you want, uh, what you hate, but I also want you to come and to look inside me. And if there's anything that's not right there," I want you to do something about that. I want you to clean me up. I want you to, to make me right in front of you as well. And so as we read through this text here a little bit, notice a couple of the things that, that we mentioned here as far as what you'll find within the passage. We'll again reading in, in verse one here of Psalm 139, as David pours out his heart, he says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit, and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. That first section of the first six verses help us understand something of God's knowledge. 
Some have called this God's omniscience, that he knows everything. But one of the things that, that pops out of this particular section for David, it's not just the fact that God can, you know, he's the scientist that knows how everything is made and how everything began. And how, it's not that. It's that he knows David personally. He knows every part of his life. He knows all the details. He knows when he gets up in the morning. He knows when he goes to bed at night. He knows what he does through his day. He, he even knows what he thinks. Not even David's closest advisors would be able to tell you what David was thinking unless David exp you know, um, let, let them know, unless David was, was offering to give that to them. But God does. He knows everything that David thinks. He knows everything that's going on. He says, even before a word comes off of my tongue, God knows about it. He says that kind of knowledge about who God is and about what he does, that's, that's, that's more than I can even imagine. I can't let, my mind can't wrap around that. In the second section from verses 7 through 12, he says, And where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. And if I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. This second section talks about God's presence with him wherever he may find himself. And David's found himself in some, in some really difficult situations, hadn't he? He's been on the run from Saul. He's been on the run from his own son, Absalom. He is, he's found himself in all kinds of difficulties running from the Philistines and others who would attack him. There are many different things that are going on in David's life, but he says, wherever I am, if I'm hiding in a cave, if I'm in the palace, it really doesn't matter where I am. God, you are here with me. What a comfort that must have been. You think about all the places that he mentions. If I, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. Makes me think of the Apostle Paul as he talks about it in 2 Corinthians that uh, there was a man who went up to the highest heavens, the third heaven, and he got to see things and he got to hear things he can't even talk about. Um, he, he mentions, if I, if I go to the depths of the sea or the depths, you are there as well. Some think that that is talking about going into the depths of, of, of Sheol or the place of the dead. Others have said that's even the deepest sea. And the, and the sea was a scary place at that particular time. It wasn't like they had, they had submarines where they could go around and look at all the things that are down there. It was a, it's a scary time for them. But he says, even in the depths, you are there as well. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I go as far east as I can go, in other words, or if I settle on the far side of the sea, on, on, on the west end of, 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 the, of his imagination, how far can you go? He said, even there, you are with me. Your right hand will guide me. He mentions in verse seven there, where can I flee from your presence? It makes me wonder if it, it hasn't happened at this time yet. Jonah is not going to live for another several hundred years before that takes place. But Jonah thinks he can get away from God. He thinks he can run from the presence of God. If I get on a boat and I go to Nineveh instead of going, or I go to Tarshish instead of Nineveh, then all of that will be fine. God won't find me there. What a silly concept. What a silly idea. David knows that there is no place that God is not. And that's, a, and that's a real comfort to him as well. He mentions in verses 13 through 16, he says, on top of all of that, he, he starts with the darkness in verse 12 and 11 and 12. But by the time he gets to chapter or verse 13 right here, he says, even in the darkness, he says, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. If you think about that particular section of scripture, he's 
That was way before CAT scans ever came along. That was way before you had ultrasounds or uh, amniocentesis or any of the other kinds of things that you might uh, be able to do today with all the, the modern technology and, and, and watching the baby develop and making sure that it's healthy and making sure that everything is going well. David has already already thought to himself, but God, you knew me. You knew every step of the way. You knew every part of the formation. You know me that well. In fact, you know me better than I know me. That's really where all of this is going, isn't it? You know my thoughts. You know my words. You know how I was formed. In fact, there is no place here on earth I could go that you're not there already. And so, it seems in verse 17, he just breaks out in praise. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. That last phrase, I think, is really significant here because David would look at the situation and it's not that 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 he is that God is still with him it's that he still gets to be with God which is the right point of view and 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 so all of this makes him just adore God for who you are because of what you've done and because of the way that you have watched over me I love you father and I love what you do in fact he says some things here that that, that come across as pretty harsh he says in verse 19 through 22 if only you would slay the wicked O God Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. David isn't just cursing his enemies. More than anything else, he is siding with God and saying, whoever are enemies of my Lord, they're my enemies as well. And he he, he is, he's, strong and he's emotional about that as well. God, I love what you love and I will hate what you hate. And then in verse 23 and following, 23 and 24, he ends up where he started. He asks God what he's already done. He said, God, you have searched me and you know me in verse one. And then he comes back in verse 23 and he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That particular section of scripture right here, this whole psalm right here reminds us of God's presence, not to be fearful, but it should bring a, a, a feeling of calm. It should bring a confidence that God is with us regardless. Are you going through good times? God's here. Are you going through difficult times? God can go through those with you as well and will. David assures us of that. And he, he is full of confidence in that himself. Are you traveling around the world? God's there too. Are you going to a different place? God is there as well. And so the question, I guess, that we would ask with all of this, when he says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Why would I want to? Why would I want to go somewhere else? Why would I want to be somewhere else where God is not? Because where God is, is peace. Where God is, is calm. Where God is, is comfort. And so we come back to this thing at the very beginning. Search me. Know me. Know everything about me. Find out if there is anything inside of me, he says in verse 23 and 24. See if there's anything offensive in me and help me get rid of it. I want to be so in tune with you. I want to know you like you know me. And what a blessing that would be someday to be able to be in the very presence of God and to be able to get to know him like he knows us. I hope you have a blessed day.